We are in Jonah chapter 2, picking up uh, actually at the last verse of chapter 1. And just to kind of recap where we have been, uh, thinking about Jonah chapter 1. And if you're still looking for Jonah, by the way, you could, if you find Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, it's the next book. And it's a little book. You can pass it three or four times while you're hunting it. So I hope that helps. And, and as I think about Jonah, the first word that pops into my mind is hypocrisy. And we got to be careful with that because when, when you think of a hypocrite, if you're like me, there's somebody that pops into your mind right away. And that is not the point of, of what we're studying. It's not about identifying hypocrisy in someone else's life. This is really about self-reflection. So think about the hypocrisy that is in your life. As we look at Jonah, his hypocrisy is very evident to us. And it's easy to want to throw stones at him. But we need to pause and think about what's going on in our life. What is the hypocrisy that I struggle with, that you struggle with? I, I think about how many times I have known what to do, the right thing to do, and chose not to do it. Hypocrisy. And if we're honest with ourselves this morning, we're all hypocrites. I mean, I could start singing a jingle, it'd sound like a Dr. Pepper commercial. I'm a hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. Wouldn't you like to be? You, guess what? You don't have to sign up to be a hypocrite because you're born that way. None of us want to be that way. And that's the redeeming power that Jesus has in our life. He can transform us into someone who behaves not like a fallen creature but someone who can choose to do what is right and glorify God in the process. So thinking about chapter 1, Jonah was commissioned to go to a great city, and we talked about that great city, Nineveh. And then he chose not to go there. He was deep asleep, and along came a great windstorm. He was down in the belly of the boat, and this storm continued to grow stronger and stronger. It escalated very rapidly into some kind of crazy storm. They brought Jonah up out of the belly of the ship. They cast lots. The lot fell on him. They tried everything they could to save the lives of the people on that ship without throwing him overboard and finally had to do so. The pagan sailors were the literary foil to Jonah. Now think about this. Jonah confessed that he believed and served and feared Yahweh, the God who made the dry land and the sea. But in reality, he was not fearing the Lord or serving Him. It was these pagan sailors who were actually fearing the Lord and serving Him. They sacrificed sacrifices and vowed vows. These pagan sailors were worshiping the one true God when Jonah was not. They just help us see the hypocrisy in Jonah's life. So they throw Jonah overboard. And that's where we're going to rejoin the text in chapter 1, verse 17. Look at it with me. It says, And the Lord appointed, or sent, or arranged for, a great fish. Here's that word great again. There was a great city, there was a great wind, a great storm, and now we have a great fish that was appointed by the Lord to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now in Hebrew, this word fish 
is singular or plural. It's either dag or daga. And there's really only one other word that describes an animal in the water that's found in Scripture, and that word is Leviathan. So those are the two words that we're playing with here. So it wasn't Leviathan that swallowed Jonah. It was a fish. But this was no ordinary fish. This was a great fish. Massive. And it was appointed by the Lord to swallow him. Dag or Daga is the original of an ancient, it's the, it's the origin of an ancient god that's mentioned in the Bible. You may recall this in 1 Samuel. They have captured the Ark of the Covenant and they take it to this Phoenician land and they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. Now this is an odd fella. He has the face of a man and the body of a fish because that's where his name comes from. And if you recall the story, they put the Ark of the Covenant of God before this giant idol, and when they get up the next morning, the idol has fallen face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant as if it's bowing down and worshiping the Ark of God. And the story goes on from there. That's not our story for this morning. But that's where that God, little g, where his name comes from. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Now many have trouble with this whole concept of a great fish swallowing Jonah, just like they would have trouble with Balaam's donkey speaking to him or a snake in the garden speaking to Eve. But as we talked about last week, there are several possibilities to the identity of this fish. I mean, I can think of seven that I, that I looked at, but one in particular was written about by a guy by the name of Dr. Joe Francis. He is a professor of biological sciences at the Master's College, earned a PhD from Wayne State University, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan Medical School. And this is what he says. I'm just going to read you this article. He says, God created great sea creatures in Genesis 121. And the greatest of them all, surely, is the mysterious blue whale. Scientists are still trying to understand how such a massive, air-breathing mammal with a stomach the size of a minivan is so well designed for life in the deep. Alone in the ocean depths swims the largest creature that ever lived on land or sea, weighing as much as 30 full-grown elephants and with a mouth big enough to swallow a bus. He devours literally tons of food every day. But unless you're shrimp-sized, you aren't on the menu because the monster of the deep, the blue whale, has no teeth. The largest blue whale that scientists have ever measured is 98 feet long, though in 1909, a whaling station reported to have captured a big blue measuring 110 feet long. A single blue whale can, can weigh over 150 tons. Now just do some math for a second. That is 300,000 pounds. This thing is massive. If you compare a blue whale to a human being, we're like half the size of his tail. Like the little fin at the, at the back of his tail. We're half the size of it. This thing is massive. I lost my spot. Even though the long-necked dinosaurs, although some of them were no longer from nose to tail, probably never came close to the weight of a big blue. His body needs, this big body needs a big mouth to feed it, he says. When big blue opens his jaw, takes a huge gulp of ocean water, a thick accordion-like folds of skin expand like a massive water balloon big enough to hold 15,000 gallons of water. So if you can imagine, this thing opens its mouth, and, and underneath its mouth, 
opens up. It's kind of like, a, have you ever seen a frog? You know, when he ribbits and the thing expands? This giant fish, when he opens his mouth, has this accordion stuff under his jaw, and he can hold 15,000 gallons of water. But it doesn't swallow the water. It immediately forces the water out by closing its mouth and squeezing the water through plates around its mouth. Tons of shrimp-like animals called krill get stuck in the plates, and then the whale swallows the krill. Now just imagine if you filled your kitchen with shrimp. Like you, your whole entire kitchen is full of shrimp. Bess is so excited right now. She loves shrimp. And then you swallowed it all at once. That's what this guy does. One gulp. Big blues belong to a group of whales called baleen whales. So instead of teeth, they have plastic-like plates called baleen, which are stacked very close together in their mouths. They're oriented so that the water can be squeezed out between them. And the baleen is made of carotene protein, which, by the way, is what your fingernails are made out of. So they're kind of soft and flexible, so he can open and close his mouth. But he gulps all this stuff up, and then he closes his mouth and squeezes the water out, and everything else is trapped. And that's what he swallows. Because big blues cannot bite their prey, they must lunge with open mouths to capture as much krill as possible. Recent research shows that big blues dive deep, come under huge schools of krill, and the tremendous muscle strength required to hold open a whale's massive mouth and shut it while lunging forward is considered, quote, the largest mechanical action in the animal kingdom as described by the Canadian Journal of Zoology. Big blues are mysterious animals. They've been difficult to study because they're almost hunted to extinction in the last century. And they don't migrate in groups like other whales. Researchers are discovering that big blues swim over vast areas of the ocean and separately travel in many different directions from each other. And just recently, though, scientists have noted male and females swimming together in pairs. It may be that big blues find long-term partners and just appear to live separately because they spend so much time apart. Big blues can actually communicate with one another over hundreds of miles by creating large, low-frequency sound waves called infrasound, too low for the human ear to detect. So even though it appears that big blues might lead lonely lives, the whales can tell, the whale calls tell another story. They are talking all the time. In fact, hearing is probably the blue whale's most important way to sense the environment. Their eyesight and sense of smell seem to be limited. Big Blue's ears are very far apart. They're about 15 feet apart. But this is a perfect design for using sound to determine the location of their friends. Two whales calling at the same frequency can gauge each other's distance and direction by the intensity of the incoming sound, just as we can determine how far away a car is. If you're standing outside and you hear the car coming or going, it's, it's kind of like that for these giant whales. They're using sound to judge distance. One of the greatest mysteries is how they produce sound so intense that it can be heard for hundreds of miles. Like other creatures, they have a throat or larynx for amplifying sound, but researchers have not found a voice box for making sound. Big blues also appear to be designed to sing at a frequency that is just slightly higher than the sound of the earth. Yes, the earth puts out several sound frequencies. And slightly lower than the sound of waves. Its frequency, if it were a fraction higher or a fraction lower, would be lost in the background noise. Could Jonah have been swallowed by a big blue? Creationists are, in, are not entirely sure what kind of great sea creature swallowed Jonah, but the big blue is certainly a candidate. 
since it has a very large capacity. Also, we know from the biblical account that Jonah sank to the deeps, to the depths of the ocean. Big blues dive deep before they come up to capture their prey. It is also believed that the whales need to take in large volumes of air to make such massive sounds. So Jonah would have had plenty of room, plenty of food, and plenty of air inside of Big Blue. And he would have had no large teeth to contend with. But more important, we know for sure that because of God's mercy, Jonah was rescued as he was tangled in the depths of the ocean. He was not crushed by the massive creature, as he easily could have been, but a marvelous picture of how our great Savior, Jesus Christ, can save any one of us from the entanglement and crushing weight of sin, no matter how deep we have sunk, if we will only call out to Him. That was the article, written by a doctor in biology. So as we think about this incredible story, there's no doubt that God could have and did appoint a great fish. He was at the right time, in the right place, and he swallowed Jonah. And we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 2. Here Jonah is praying to Yahweh, and he's recounting his near drowning due to sin. Look at verse 1 with me. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Now I want to pause here just for a second and think about the stomach of a blue whale or the stomach of other great fish. They don't have stomachs like you and I do. There's actually three or four compartments to their stomach. The first compartment is called the fore stomach, F-O-R-E, like in front of. It is a big fancy storage container. And these large fish use their muscles to squeeze what's in this first compartment of their stomach into the second part of their stomach, which is called the main stomach. Then there's a connecting channel between the main stomach and the pyloric stomach. There's actually four compartments to this stomach. The first compartment would be like a large container. Now, I'm thinking about like on a container ship. So imagine Jonah has been swallowed by this great fish. There's air, there's krill, there's Jonah, there's darkness, there's all kinds of other Mediterranean Sea garbage in there. Not an ideal situation to live in, but certainly one that could sustain him for three days. The four stomach acts like a large organic storage container, and it holds the food consumed by the whale. And here's another interesting fact. It has no secretory glands in it. There's nothing being secreted from any glands in the fore stomach. Just an interesting little note there. Verse 2. And Jonah said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and He answered me. He heard my prayer. I cried for help from the depth, literally the belly of Sheol. Now, Sheol is described as a residence of the dead. Here, in this context, it would be considered the underworld. Imagine Jonah has been swallowed by this fish. This great fish then dives deep, and he's crying out to the Lord from the depths of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, there's tons of irony here. If you remember back with me, as Jonah was running from the Lord, he boarded this ship that was going in the opposite direction of where God was sending him. And then he descended into 
the belly of that ship as far down as he could go because he wanted to be there. He was hiding and running. Now he's in a very similar kind of situation. He's in the belly of the sea. I mean, if you were going to run and hide, this is about as far away as you can get. But he's not there of his own will. Hence the irony. If you were going to try and hide, this would be a great place to hide. I don't recommend that you try it, though. He describes it as the belly of Sheol. And he says it was from there that he cried for help. And you, Lord, heard my voice. You heard my cry. You heard my prayer. Verse 3. For you had cast, you had literally thrown me into the deep waters, into the heart of the seas, which means the middle or the bottom. And the current engulfed me, the stream, the flood. It literally surrounded me and enveloped me. All your breakers or waves and billows that you had sent passed over me. He's recognizing who is in control here. He's been thrown overboard. The sea is tossing him around. And he's recognizing that God is the one that sent these waves, these billows, and they were passing over him. Verse 4, So I said, or I thought, I have been expelled from your sight. I've literally been sent away from your eyes. I'm, I'm no longer worthy of your attention. I've been sent away. Nevertheless, and this is probably more of a question than a statement, how will I look again towards your holy temple? He is down in the belly, the depths of the sea, as well as the belly of this fish. And he's crying out to God, wondering how he's ever going to see the temple again. There is thick irony here. Jonah was commissioned by God to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent of their sins. And he was on the run. Last week when we were looking at what he was doing, he was saying one thing and doing the exact opposite. He didn't care about the people in Nineveh. He didn't care about what God wanted him to do. He didn't care about going back to the temple. He didn't care about praying. He was running as far away as he could in the opposite direction of where God sent him and hiding in the depths of whatever he could find. Now he's in a very similar situation. But you start to see the transformation that's taking place in Jonah. How am I ever going to get back to the temple? I I'm in the depths of the sea here. How can you even hear my cry or hear my prayer? I'm completely gone from your sight and gone from your attention, which is where he was trying to get to in the first place. Verse 5, Water encompassed me to the point of death. The, the wording that he uses here is that the water was up to his throat. So you can imagine, he's in the sea, there's a storm raging, and, and he's here. And I don't know about you, but a long time ago I had to take some swimming lessons and they, they threw you in the deep end and made you tread water for an hour. Anybody else have to do that? I'm telling you, I couldn't wait for that hour to be over. I mean, every muscle in my body was burning. I don't know how long Jonah is out there trying to tread water in a tornado But the water is up to his neck. 
He is near drowning. He says, the deep, that word could also be translated abyss, engulfed me. Weeds, which are either seaweed or reeds, were wrapped around my neck. He is probably exhausted at this point. It's, it's that breath before you go under. And we don't know, I mean, in the darkness of this storm, we don't know if he saw this giant fish coming. It doesn't say. We don't know if he saw him swimming toward him. He may or may not have known where he was when he got swallowed. I think he was happy to be alive, though. Another interesting fact is there's no distress detected about having been swallowed by the great fish. No, nowhere in here does Jonah complain that he got swallowed by a giant fish. And as you're mentally trying to picture this, this is no children's story. So don't, please don't have the colored pictures of, you know, Pinocchio and Geppetto in your head. That's not what's going on here. Or Finding Nemo. This guy has been swallowed by a giant fish. It's dark. It's warm. Assuming that this is a mammal, and assuming that the depths of the Mediterranean Sea are warm, and he has available oxygen to breathe, and small shrimp-like creatures to eat. Be a little bit larger than popcorn shrimp. Krill. If Bess was there, she would be in heaven. <laughs> Bess is a friend of mine, and she loves shrimp. We went to the... Uh, Chinese buffet, and you, you can't get enough shrimp, can you? I mean, shrimp goes with everything. Yeah, just ask Bess. So, hopefully, Jonah likes shrimp as much as you do, Bess. But he's in this dark place. There's air to breathe. Food to eat. He's there for three days and three nights. And the text says... And then he prayed. I mean, you want to talk about strong-willed. I heard stubborn over here somewhere. <laughs> There's words floating around. I mean, this guy was on the run from the Lord. And clearly, God selected him to be ejected from the cruise ship in the Mediterranean in the middle of a tornado, a great storm, huge, massive. He's swallowed by a great fish, and it took the boy three days. And then he prayed. The word hypocrite keeps coming to my mind. And before we throw stones at Jonah... We need to look in the mirror. There is clearly hypocrisy in Jonah's life. And there is clearly hypocrisy in my own. So Jonah prays to Yahweh. He's recounting his near drowning. And then he begins to recount his descending. Look at verse 6. I descended. I went down to the roots, the very bottoms of the mountains, he says. The earth or the netherworld with its bars was around me forever. He, he's imagining that the netherworld is like a city and there are barred gates there. He descends down to the lowest part of the earth the netherworld, and the gates close behind him. He is locked out. 
or perhaps locked in the netherworld. He's in a prison at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. That's what he's describing. <coughs> they barred me in from behind. I was forever there. It was like an eternal prison. But he said, but you have brought up my life from the pit, from the corruption. O oh Lord, my God, you have brought me up from the netherworld. I was locked in a watery prison at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And you, O oh Lord, have brought me up from there. While I was fainting away, he says in verse 7, my soul was fainting away is the way he's describing this. When that was happening, he says, I remembered the Lord. It's as if he remembered to then call out. Three days later, he's in the belly of this fish. And then he remembers to call out to the Lord. And my prayer came to you in your holy temple, which is in heaven. He's describing his life fading away. This is like a prayer on his deathbed. And he remembers to call out to the Lord. And he said the Lord heard his cry. He heard him from the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. And then Jonah says in verse 8, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. In other words, those who worship worthless, empty vanities of nothingness, they forfeit or abandon the mercy and the loyalty that could be theirs. Just let that sink in. They forfeit the mercy of God if they're worshiping vain idols. And it begs this question, have you ever forfeited anything? I mean, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is sports. You know, I, I remember coaching a team and we showed up for a game and the other team didn't show up. So they forfeited. We won. Truth be told, we would have lost that game had they shown up. I mean, they could have shown up with their cheerleaders and we would have lost. But we won that one because the other team forfeited. I remember as a kid, we were, I don't know where we went, but we, we had a couple of dogs at the house and we had driven very far to find some dog food that was inexpensive and they were raffling off free giant bags of dog food. So I threw my name in. And it turned out that I, this is the only thing I've ever won in my whole life, by the way. <laughs> A couple of bags of dog food. Dog food. <laughs> but imagine if I had forfeited that. I mean, I could have. I didn't have to take free bags of dog food. But let me up the game a little bit. Imagine you get something in the mail that says you've won a Ferrari. And the key is there. All you got to do is go down to the dealership, put the key in the ignition, sign the paper, it's yours. And you're like, nah, I don't need a Ferrari. You just forfeit it. I'm going to up the game one more time. Jonah is saying that people who worship vain idols are forfeiting the mercies of God. And here he is, on the run, in the belly of a fish, way down in the belly of the Mediterranean Sea, and he's recognizing 
that what he, I'm reading between the lines here, but he's recognizing that what he is doing is the wrong thing. You, you start to see the transformation of Jonah. It's day three in the belly of the fish, but we're starting to see some transforming. Now, I wish I could tell the rest of the story like this. Jonah gets out and he serves the Lord wholeheartedly for the rest of his life. If you've read ahead, you know that ain't the story. But guess what? Jonah is a hypocrite. Just like me. Just like we all are. How does God work in your life? I can tell you how He works in my life. He leads me to these moments where He teaches me something. Transformation happens. And then I go on from that lesson and I go do the next boneheaded thing. Can I get a witness? No, I'm just kidding. You don't, please don't raise your hand. <laughs> I mean, think about how He works in our life. The reality is He's gently leading us and teaching us and we learn a little something and then we still mess up. And then we learn a little something else. And, and that's Jonah's story. Thank goodness I didn't have to be thrown off a ship in the Mediterranean Sea. But that's Jonah's story. Now he's in the belly of the fish three days. He prays to the Lord. The Lord hears his prayer. And look at what he does next in verse 9. Jonah makes a resolute promise to God. Look at what he says. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That is a public sound, a public declaration of praise. Jonah is making a resolute promise to Yahweh that he will publicly declare praise to him, that which I have vowed or promised, I will pay. This is Jonah's resolve and firm intention. And then he says, salvation is from the Lord. Deliverance is from the Lord. Rescue belongs to the Lord. Amen. He's still in the belly of the fish. He is making a resolute promise that, Lord, when you deliver me, I am going to publicly proclaim praise to your name. And rescue, deliverance, salvation belongs to the Lord. He is in the darkness of this container part of this great fish's stomach. And he is praying this prayer. There is some transformation happening in Jonah's life. And look at what happens next. Verse 10. The Lord commanded the great fish, and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. Now, I've heard all kinds of stories about what this dude must have smelled like when he hit the beach. I'll let you use your sanctified imagination to figure that out. I'm imagining he smells a whole lot like krill. That's what I'm thinking. But he's on the beach. And he's just prayed a prayer. And he's vowed to the Lord to make sacrifices and praise and public proclamations. What does that sound like? Does that sound like those pagan sailors three days ago? It kind of does. Remember, they were the foil, the literary foil to display the hypocrisy in Jonah's life. Suddenly, he's making very similar actions. He's doing the same thing. 
There's been a U-turn that happened in the belly of that fish on a spiritual level. Ironically, he's also made a U-turn geographically because he probably got spit out on the beach near Joppa where he got on the boat to begin with. So geographically, Jonah made a big U-turn, but spiritually, he made a U-turn as well. And it leads us to this conclusion. As we think about the hypocrisy in our life, do you really fear the Lord? Do you serve Him? Do you sacrifice to Him? Do you publicly declare praise to the Lord, Yahweh, the God who created the dry land and the sea? Do your real-life actions contradict the words that you say and render them meaningless? I mean, when we started, Jonah was telling everybody, Oh, I serve the Lord. I serve Yahweh, the God who made the dry land and the sea. He was saying it, but he wasn't doing it. What about you and me? Maybe it's time for you and I to cry out to the Lord to be rescued from the hypocrisy from the sin in our life? What sin is preventing you from fully serving the Lord and making a public declaration of His praise? Is it time for you to make a spiritual U-turn? Is it time for you to have that transformation take place in your life that we just saw God do in Jonah's life.